In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, dear fellow redeemed by the blood of Christ. Do you ever think about how much in your life you have to prove yourself? It's constant, right? Day after day throughout your entire life, you constantly have to prove yourself to others. It starts when you're a kid in school. For what are kids doing in school? Proving themselves. With each new quiz or with each new test, they are proving that they have learned the new information and can go on. It doesn't matter what they did on the past quiz or the past test in the past school year. It only matters how they are doing in that new test, that new quiz in the new school year. Kids constantly have to prove themselves at school. And it doesn't stop when you get out of school either. Whether you're applying for a new job, applying for a new home loan, asking that special someone to marry you, you constantly have to prove yourself, prove that you are worthy enough for those blessings. And then once you receive those blessings, then you have to keep proving yourselves to prove that you should be able to keep those blessings. If you think about it, our entire life revolves around proving ourselves to others. And since that's often what our entire life is, having to prove ourselves to others, it's easy to think that that must be our relationship with God. Our relationship with God must be one where we have to constantly prove ourselves to him, prove that we are worthy enough to receive blessings from him, prove that we are worthy enough to keep those blessings, because if that's the way everything else in this world works, well, then that must be the way our relationship with God works, right? Well, thank God it doesn't. For if that were our relationship with God, one where we had to keep proving ourselves to be worthy enough to be in his presence, each and every one of us would fail. As sinners, we would fail every single day. And so today, let's rejoice. Let's rejoice that you have nothing to prove. Not in Christ, not to God. You have nothing to prove. Why? Well, Jesus shows us in our text from St. Matthew's Gospel. You see, our text that we read earlier from St. Matthew's Gospel, it takes place during the Tuesday of Holy Week, the week that Jesus suffered and died. So earlier on Palm Sunday, Jesus had rode into Jerusalem triumphantly on that donkey amid the shouts of praise and thanks. And on that day, he had the first confrontation with the chief priests and elders of the people, for they told Jesus to make your people quiet. And Jesus says, well, if they stop singing, the stones are going to cry out. On Monday, he had a second confrontation with the chief priests and teachers of the law. You see, that's when he cleansed the temple, driving out all the money changers, saying, you're not going to turn my father's house into a den of robbers. 
This especially made the chief priests and elders of the people angry. You see, not only was he taking money away from them since they got a cut of everything that was sold at the temple, but on top of that, the people were beginning to follow Jesus, not these chief priests and teachers of the law. That's why they were getting really irritated. And so when Jesus returned to the temple courts on Tuesday of Holy Week, what did these chief priests and elders try to do? Well, like any good human being, they tried to prove themselves. For they came up with a question to Jesus, a question where they thought they could trap him, a question where they thought they could prove to everyone that they were the true religious leaders of Israel. For they said to Jesus, by whose authority are you doing these things? And the chief priest thought that was the perfect question. Because if Jesus answered by saying, I'm doing this by God's authority, well, then they would accuse him of blasphemy, which, incidentally, they would do a couple of days later as he stood before the high priest. But if Jesus responded by saying, I'm doing this by some man's authority, well, then they could discredit Jesus before the people, saying he's just a lone wolf who's looking for some sort of attention. Yes, the chief priests and elders thought this was the perfect question to trick Jesus and to prove their their authority, to prove that they were the true leaders of Israel. But in response to that question, Jesus just asked them one simple question. He said, John's baptism, where did it come from? And this put the chief priests and elders in a quandary. For if they said it came from God, then Jesus would wonder why they didn't believe John. But if they said that it came from man, well, then the people would get angry because they considered John a prophet. It's why the only thing they could say is we don't know. You see, these chief priests and elders were trying to prove themselves to Jesus. They were trying to prove that they were worthy enough to be the true religious leaders of Israel. But with just one question, God showed him how foolish they were. For with just one question, Jesus showed them that the only thing they could prove is that they were sinful. And wouldn't the same thing happen with you and me today? If we try to prove ourselves to God, prove that we are worthy enough to receive blessings because look at all the great things that we do, all Jesus would have to do is just ask us one question. And it wouldn't go so well for us, right? Because any time we try to prove anything to God, on our own, the only thing we prove is that we're sinners who sin. And that's actually what Jesus is teaching when he continues on with this parable of the two sons. For immediately after this conversation with the chief priests and elders of the people, he goes into this parable of the two sons, this parable that's easy to understand what's happening, but it's actually quite difficult to interpret the spiritual meaning, right? Right? For Jesus says a father has two sons. He tells both of them to go work in the vineyard. The one says no, (laughs) but then he changes his mind and goes. The other says yes, but then he changes his mind and doesn't go. And while it's easy to understand what's happening, (laughs) do you understand what Jesus is teaching with this parable? He's actually teaching that we can't do anything to prove ourselves to God. After all, that's what the chief priests and elders were trying to do, right? They were putting the focus on themselves and saying, look at what we are able to do. They were trying to prove themselves to God, but with this parable, Jesus is teaching that is impossible. How? Well, let's talk about the second son first, the one who said he would go work and then chose not to. It's very easy for us to act like that second son, especially if we're trying to prove ourselves to God, right? 
For if we're trying to prove ourselves to God, prove that we are worthy enough to receive blessings from him because of all the great things that we do, if that's what we're trying to do, focus on ourselves, that whenever our Heavenly Father tells us to do something, we will say, yes, I'll do that. And no, I won't do that. And you know what? We'll actually mean it. We'll actually try our best to obey him. But just like the son failed to follow through on his promise to go work in his father's vineyard, so also if the focus is on us, we're going to fail to obey our father in heaven. We're sinners. In fact, as I said, the only thing that we can prove by our own powers is that we're people who constantly sin and deserve to be punished. The other son actually proves that, doesn't he? For when the father said to him, go work in my vineyard, he flat out says, no, I will not. Talk about being wicked and evil. Can you imagine ever saying that to your father? And yet, for whatever reason, he actually changes his mind and then goes. We aren't told the reason, but for our purposes today, know that he changed his mind and went. My dear Christian friends, doesn't that describe you? You see, you and me, we are sinful by nature, sinful from the time that we have come into this world. It's why so often we display it by the sins we commit in thought, word, and in deed. There are even times that we are so blatant that we tell our Father in heaven, no, I'm not going to follow what you want me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do because I think what I want to do is a whole lot better than what you want me to do. We all can think of times that we have done that, right? But then each and every one of you has had a change of heart. Just like that son in the parable, you have had a change of heart. You began to obey your father in heaven. And unlike the son, we actually know why you have a change of heart. It's not because of something good you did on your own. It's not because you dug down deep and proved to God that you're better than most people around here, so you deserve some blessings. No. Instead, you have a change of heart because God came down to you through his word. God came down to you through his word, and he gave you the forgiveness of sins he won by his bloody death and glorious resurrection. And once he comes down to you through his word to give you that free and full forgiveness of all your sins, well, then you're changed. You have nothing else to prove. For the forgiveness of sins takes the burden and the pressure off of you. For the forgiveness of sins makes you holy. When you're washed in the blood of Christ, it really does remove all those wicked acts from you. It really does make you worthy enough to spend eternity with your God in heaven. And if that's what the forgiveness of sins has done, make you worthy enough to stand before God for all eternity, then what else is there for you to prove? Nothing. You're holy and you're perfect. This is why our relationship with God can't be one where we're constantly trying to prove ourselves, saying, look at me, look at the great things that I am doing. For not only can, is the only thing you can prove is that you are a sinner, but on top of that, you have nothing to prove, not if you are washed in the blood of Christ. You're already holy and worthy enough to, to spend eternal life with him. And so once you are washed in the blood of Christ, well, then you do what your father wants you to do, not because you have to in order to prove something to him, but you do what your heavenly father wants you to do because that is who you are, a changed person. The chief priest and the elders never understood that. They never understood that their relationship with God is one of receiving forgiveness from him as opposed to proving themselves to him. It's why they were always angry at Jesus. It's why they were jealous of the tax collectors and prostitutes who repented. And it's why they never received any comfort. But you are different. You have been changed by the powerful word of God. 
You know that it's not about proving something to God for what could you prove anyways, but it's all about God coming down to you to give you the forgiveness of sin. And since you know that's what your relationship with God is all about, you know you have nothing to prove. Instead, you go out into this world and show love to God and show love to your neighbor, not because you have to, but you do it because you are a redeemed child of God and an heir of eternal life. You have been changed. And so you go and obey your Father in heaven out of thankful love for everything that he has done for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise as we confess the one true faith, using the words of the Nicene Creed as printed in the bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen.